Michael Burry has come out and slammed the fiscal stimulus that's ongoing in 2022, and particularly the $2 trillion or so of government spending. He's highlighting that this is really not very good for the economy, and could be quite inflationary at a period where inflation is already incredibly high. In the United States, inflation last came in at 8.5%, and before that, 9.1%. And also in Europe, inflation is soaring. The UK is expected to get up to 18% inflation. Michael Burry, against this backdrop, has criticised fiscal expenditure, and criticised what is essentially fiscal stimulus. In a tweet, he specifically stated, With recent spending bills, including the student loan forgiveness, now approaching $2 trillion this year, we have the emergence of the fiscal put. Not just for COVID anymore. And will be as good for America's economy as sugar is for babies. That is, the fiscal stimulus that the Biden government is doing is not going to be very beneficial and could exacerbate underlying inflation concerns. So what I'm going to look at in this video are some of the specifics underlying this to evaluate whether Michael Burry is correct. And broadly speaking, I do agree with him. The primary ones that he's talking about here are really threefold. Firstly, there's a general spending bill, which is $1.5 trillion or so. Secondly, there is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a misnomer because it isn't really going to reduce inflation. That involves another $300 to $400 billion of expenditure. Then we have the student debt relief, which the estimates are it could be up to $300 billion as well. All of these measures could potentially be inflationary, but I'll be focusing on the Inflation Reduction Act and the student debt relief to go through why those are ultimately not beneficial for the economy. Of course, if you have any, any thoughts about either of these acts or the fiscal stimulus more generally, definitely do let me know that in the comments below. But otherwise, let's dig a little bit deeper into what's going on with the economy to evaluate whether Michael Burry is correct. The first one I'll go over is the Inflation Reduction Act. As I indicated, this is really a misnomer. It isn't actually going to reduce inflation, or at least it's incredibly unlikely to. The Inflation Reduction Act has several key provisions, and it is overall not very good policy. The first one, which is the most inflationary here, is really the $300 billion or so of expenditure on climate change related initiatives. There are several subcomponents to this, including credits, for example, for carbon capture. However, in general terms, whenever the government is giving up money in this case, it is going to be inflationary, at least in the short to medium term. Over the long term, one can argue that getting cheaper energy from renewables might reduce inflation over the long term. However, that will take many years to really get into place. In the short term, the here and now, when inflation is at 8.5%, this is expenditure that is inflationary. There's no two ways about this. Joe Biden has argued that some of the credits to, for example, improve insulation and the like, could reduce energy bills. However, those are really playing at the margin. The bulk of this is just straight up expenditure. The Inflation Reduction Act could also be indirectly inflationary. And here I'm really focusing on the tax on share buybacks. The Inflation Reduction Act imposes a 1% tariff on share repurchases. The issue with this, of course, is that share buybacks are actually generally good policy, good for companies and good for the economy. Share buybacks occur when the company has run out of profitable internal investment opportunities. The company then pays out that money to shareholders, those shareholders can then spend the money in a more productive manner. For example, investing in a company that will generate more growth and will be better for those shareholders. Put differently, companies pay out this money when they don't have good quality investment opportunities, where the return on invested capital would exceed the cost of capital. Indeed, companies aren't replacing CapEx with a share buyback. Companies do a share buyback after they have run out of profitable CapEx. Companies also are not using share buybacks to prop up share prices or prop up EPS so that managers can hit an earnings target. Because clearly, compensation planners have already planned for that type of eventuality. And as I've indicated in prior videos, the UK government has commissioned a report into this. This was done by Professor Alex Edmonds of London Business School, one of the preeminent scholars in the area. He specifically found, through a survey of the relevant literature and his own analysis, the companies use share or stock buybacks in a manner that is efficient. That is, they use it once they have run out of good quality internal investments. If the government is deterring share buybacks, that means companies will store that money internally, then they'll get this cash stockpile, which the literature shows companies tend to waste. Either the companies get complacent about expenditure, 
all agency conflicts are enlivened and managers fritter away the money on self-interested investments. Or the company has a money chasing deals type phenomenon where it has more cash than it has profitable investments. So it starts investing in less and less productive uses of capital. That in general terms can be inflationary because here we're just throwing money without a productive benefit. By contrast, if you have share buybacks and then those shareholders who receive the money go out and invest productively in something that will generate economic growth, that would be less inflationary than the company just frittering away money on random rubbish. So in general terms, the Inflation Reduction Act is not good policy, as I've alluded to in prior videos, but it is also inflationary. Michael Burry also alludes to the idea of student debt relief or student debt forgiveness, and he highlights that this itself could be inflationary. I've talked about this in a prior video as well. Now, I generally agree with Michael Burry in this context. So the way the student debt forgiveness works is that if you're earning up to $125,000, then you get $10,000 of debt relief. If you receive the Pell Grant, which is primarily targeted at lower socioeconomic uh, individuals, then you'd get $20,000 of debt relief. Now, as I've indicated, this only applies if you're earning up to $125,000. The government is also extending their pause on student debt repayments and they're enabling people to cap their repayments at 5% of their income. Michael Burry is indicating this could be inflationary, and he is quite right. The $10,000 reduction in debt loads is basically like giving $10,000 of cash to individuals. Not quite the same as parachuting in dollar bills to those individuals, but it is similar. I either have less debt load, therefore their repayments each month will go down. This is further exacerbated because those repayments don't need to be done until 2023. It's further exacerbated because these repayments are not capped. So people now have more disposable income than they would have otherwise. This therefore is inflationary because individuals can go out and spend that money. You then have to add onto this the so-called wealth effect. That is when individuals have less debt outstanding, they feel wealthier and therefore are more inclined to spend. This therefore can give rise to more inflation. So as a result, the debt relief here is inherently inflationary, as Michael Burry is pointing out. This is in addition to the other bad policy aspects of it, the arbitrariness of that $125,000 cap, which penalizes people who have gone out and earned a lot of money, who have really succeeded after college. It penalizes those individuals. This is the inherent unfairness of people who never went to college paying for these degrees. Then you add on to this the perverse incentive, which is basically that it's now encouraging students or prospective students to go out and borrow as much student debt as possible, in the assumption the government might relieve them of this debt. That's obviously not an outcome you would necessarily want as a government, because it's not the incentive you want to create. Rather, you would want to create the incentive that people go out and pay off their debt as soon as possible. You'd want to create the incentive that the government isn't just going to bail you out. So in general terms, Michael Burry is rather correct about the student debt relief. So if Michael Burry is correct about the inherently inflationary nature of the fiscal spending in 2022, how then does this affect the economy? Well, clearly it will feed into inflation data, albeit with something of a leg. Now, the problem here, of course, is there are several factors that influence inflation. On the one hand, you might have fiscal stimulus, which increases demand, which can feed into inflation going up. But on the other hand, you have the underlying commodity issue, which also has some global drivers behind it. So you've got multiple factors that are all going to feed into the inflation data. However, this increases the likelihood that the Federal Reserve is going to have to increase rates by more and for longer. And therefore, the Federal Reserve might need to be more aggressive. It therefore heightens the risk that there is a deeper, more severe recession, if we're not already in a recession right now, given that the US had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So in general terms, this is not great news for the economy. Because exacerbating inflation, when inflation is already running at 8.5% in the United States, when it's looming in double digits in Europe, when the UK is facing a possible inflation rate of 18%, you don't really want to be exacerbating inflation in this climate. So it generally is not good news for the economy. It might not be catastrophically bad, but it's certainly not the type of news the government should be sending out right now. Rather, the government should be trying to exercise fiscal restraint rather than spending willy-nilly in the hope of buying votes for the midterm elections. Now, with all of Michael Burry's talk about how fiscal stimulus might be inflationary and how we might be heading into an economic catastrophe, you're going to need some data to analyze what you might invest in. Which brings me to Simply Wall Street. Simply Wall Street is an online platform that has a ton of information about almost any company you can think of. 
and it has information about the fundamentals of these firms, how these firms compare to their peer groups, analyst forecasts, and estimates of these companies' values. So for example, if you're looking at retailers like Target or Walmart or whatever, and you're trying to get fundamental information about these firms, Simply Wall Street might help you out. If you use my link in the description below, you can sign up for one of their free plans, but you can also get 30% off one of their premium offerings. I found it really useful, and hopefully you will as well. So that's an overview of Michael Burry's thoughts about the fiscal stimulus ongoing. These are reasonably unsurprising, given Michael Burry's more conservative leanings, at least as it comes to fiscal policy. And it is unsurprising he's taking the Biden administration to task for this fiscal stimulus. Nevertheless, if you have any thoughts about what Michael Burry is saying here, about whether Michael Burry is correct about the fiscal stimulus being inflationary, or whether Michael Burry maybe is off base, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And otherwise, of course, it would be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And hopefully I will see you for future videos as well.